Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to our presentation. So my name is Harris Khan. I am a software engineer at Bloomberg, and I'm here with my coworker, Yao Lin, senior software engineer. And we are part of the workflow orchestration team. And today we're going to be talking about some of the growing pains associated with scaling to 10,000 workflows per week. So at Bloomberg, our team's mission is to maintain and provide a fully managed general utility workflow orchestration platform for our users. And this is so that they can orchestrate their tasks in a cloud native environment. Ideally, we want to make sure that it's secure, reliable, and accessible for all of our internal users, despite what their um, skill level might be in Argo or Kubernetes. And as I mentioned before, uh, we offer our users general utility compute. So that means that they can bring in their own containers so that they can orchestrate their tasks. And many users on our platform uh, run a diverse array of jobs. Some of these jobs are something like AI model training, machine maintenance, and even financial analysis. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So our platform, as you might guess, fits right on top of Argo workflows and because of our user needs and because we're a fully managed platform, it's important that we give our users um, certain functional requirements that Argo workflows might not fulfill by itself. Um, this could be, for example, network segmentation so that we could provide um, guarded traffic, uh, isolated traffic, and guard the production environment, uh, approval guards, cross-zone reliability, as well as the ability to uh, allow our users to schedule um, their workflows and also have the, these workflows trigger based on events. And because we love our users so much, we also want to give them the right self-service tools so that they can observe their workflows and go under the hood if they need to debug their containers. Now, as our user base has grown significantly over the past uh, couple months, we've noticed that many of our users have different SLA requirements. Now, one user might be running a maintenance job that would run at most once, whereas another user might want to run an analysis job that they need to run at least once, and it might be persistent. So these diverse SLA requirements bring us to our first growth pain, and that is tenant cluster isolation where you know, it might be a good idea to have our tenants on different workload clusters so that we could adhere to these uh, SLA requirements. Moving on, now because uh, our user base is continuing to grow and many of our users are running important jobs, high availability is extremely important for our platform. Additionally, um, many of our users are worried that you know, cluster maintenance might impact their jobs and that's why this brings us to our second growth factor which is data center resiliency. Now, I want you to imagine that you're a user on our platform and you might notice that your pods are potentially running slow or maybe your container is running into some errors. You might ask yourself, um, you know, is there something wrong with the whole system? Could it be that I'm under allocating resources? And this quick example highlights the importance and the need for our next growth factor which is observability and troubleshooting. Um, it's important that we empower our users so that, you know, despite what their level is, that they can look at their um, workflows and also have the right tools so that they can debug uh, anything that might come in their way. And that also helps us as platform maintainers as well. Now, an example that actually combines the three GOAT factors together that we recently experienced was that we had a workflow cluster that during peak hours was going through a lot of timeouts. And so we decided to research this, um, pull the sleeves up, and we found that it could potentially be CPU throttling. Um, we looked into whether it was a memory allocation issue. We even looked and saw if it was a disk and IO issue. As it turns out, it was actually none of these. And the real issue was that we were overloading our Kubernetes API server. And why is that? 
So because all of our tenants are all on one workload cluster, we just had way too many job runs and too many updates from our tenants and their workflows uh, going straight towards the API server. And you know this brings back that factor that I was talking about before, which was tenant cluster isolation. Something like cluster sharding could potentially remediate this, right? If we have different clusters and on those clusters we have the workflows running, instead of all of them being on just one workload cluster, that could remediate um, some of the pressure that's going towards the Kubernetes server. Additionally, um, this brings back observability and troubleshooting because this example shows how important it is to be able to understand what's happening with uh, tenant cluster activity. And as you just saw, these are the three main growth factors that we've been dealing with recently as our user base has considerably um, gained more. And firstly, we saw the uh, observability and troubleshooting is extremely important, not just for us as platform maintainers, but also for our users so that they can manage and analyze their workflows in real time. Additionally, we saw because of high availability that data center resiliency is extremely important to us and it's only gonna get more important. And lastly, we saw that tenant workload isolation is also just going to keep getting more important, uh, not only for addressing our users' SLA requirements, but also in search situations like you saw before, where we could use something like cluster sharding to alleviate some of the pressure on our API server. And now I'm gonna pass it to Yao Lin, who is going to dive deeper into these three topics, and then also talk about some solutions we have in mind. Thanks, Harris. Uh, we're setting up the contest here and help us identify the three major solutions. Now, let's uh, take a journey to see how, uh, like, what things we can do to uh, make these solutions come true. So, let's start with something simple. Uh, imagine you have um, a workload. A workflow cluster installed in a standard way and run some typical uh, tenants. Ten containers, and for starter, you will have um, the tenants, logs, and the metrics. So inside Bloomberg, we have our own dedicated platform to persist the log and metrics. That platform also comes with the integration with uh, query and the visualization functionalities. So it's our go-to place to uh, put our logs and metrics. Then it becomes our responsibility to forward those tenants uh, indicators there. Um, also, um, user might want to know some system uh, indicators so that we can figure out uh, things more in more detail. So it's also our responsibility to build up the dashboards uh, as a template for tenants to look at. That includes the indicator from uh, cube metrics, container metrics, um, workflow controller logs, and also something more. However, these standard things are just not sufficient to answer all of our questions. Let's look at the examples here. Um, by default, the workflow controller does not help um, gener uh, emit the metrics uh, per namespace. And in order to do that, uh, it has to be done by putting extra configuration into individual workflow spec. So how can we avoid that? Also, if specifically we want to capture a certain state of workflow or pod that is not considered standard in the general community, but we do need that, then let's summarize our needs here. So firstly, we want custom metrics um, so in one scenario, we want the metrics to be published with the tags we define without injecting anything into the workflow spec. Uh, and on the other hand, we also want to guard the metrics that comes from our system um, just in case that some metrics are published uh, with crazy amount of time series. So from that, we also need specific log lines to help us identify certain state of a workflow or pod. Oftentimes, those states are considered problematic. Uh, let's take a real example. If a pod is configured with 
a typo in the mount path, then that pod is likely to be pending forever. And in our context here, we want to kill that pod immediately if that state is reached, say it stays for an hour. Then we can also think about that a little bit further. Can we avoid waking up our tenants during the midnight just to capture that issue? We can just leverage our system to automatically reconcile that kind of state. Then uh, we first consider, can we just achieve that by putting proper configuration of our installation of the workflow controllers? Then it turns out it's not overly complicated and it sometimes it requires some enhancement to be put in. And as we all know, the workflow controller is already complicated and busy at its own task, which is the orchestration itself. Those housekeeping work can be better implemented in a separate channel. So uh, we did a little research, like what's the difficulties implementing a controller by your own? So actually it's not that difficult. Uh, this is a typical implementation uh, we took from the Cube Builder website. Initially, you'll need to implement uh, events filters. They call it predicates. Uh, and it can actually be implemented more like event handlers to publish the metrics. And also, once things reach the uh, reconciler, then it's time for you to capture a certain state and take actions for those states if needed. And actually, that works pretty surprisingly well, and it was surprisingly easy to implement than we initially thought. Now, uh, one problem solved. Now let's look at the data center resiliency. It's from a more higher scope. Uh, we often mention that in the, with the term multi-cluster federation. So it has been a long-standing topic and it's difficult. There's no one good solution for that. So there are many projects and many aspects you try you can try to get that solved, um, but depends on the use case, the needs. There's just no straightforward answer. Um, projects would include like Kamada and, o and OCM or something you develop in-house. But here, uh, we're not just to compare and uh, con contrast each solutions and try to teach you which is better. But we want to highlight an important aspect in this approach is that you well, you can't avoid to build a unified API to expose to our users. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, we what we offer is actually a general utility compute platform. Many of our users are not familiar with Kubernetes. Um, that's an issue we often overlooked um, in our daily life because we are pretty familiar with Kubernetes. So um, that API needs to handle things in a more user logical way. By doing that, it doesn't, it does not only bring benefits to our tenants, but also give us a action space to do like the re-architecting if you are picking up new solutions for those federation or you want to switch your federations. Okay, um, and we arrive at our third problem here, the tenant workload isolation. So the bottleneck of the timeout as we identified before is on the API server. Now let's think about how can we solve that. Uh, can we solve that by adding more powerful hardwares? Obviously no, because um, the instance of the, the capacity of the API server is quite limited on one cluster. Um, or let's think about how can we change the way we deploy our workflow controller. So the workflow controller, in case you are not familiar with that, is basically the backbone of the orchestrating um, feature. So it can be installed in two ways. One is per cluster, and that orchestrates 
um, all the namespaces on this cluster, or it can also be installed in a namespace the way which a controller only responsible for one namespace workload. But however, that we researched and realized it doesn't really solve the problem because workflow controller itself is not the bottleneck, but the API server. Then that leaves us no choice except that we need to build smaller but more workload clusters. So that will require us to build more um, automation tools for these clusters. Otherwise, it will just kill us by uh, linearly increasing the clusters when our tenants, tenants namespace grows. So let's look at how we are going to shard the workload. Um, yeah, so imagine in this hypothetical scenarios, we have four namespaces, and some namespaces are pretty heavy. Imagine they are our pro users and know everything about Kubernetes, and let's say they run hundreds of workflows every day. And there are like more light users, so they probably run workflow once per day or once per hour. Then these tenant namespaces should be evenly distributed uh, across all these clusters. Now, so you may ask two questions. So how can I easily uh, manage such many workflow clusters? And secondly, how can I identify which namespaces are lighter and which are heavier? So we can uh, balance them in a more reasonable way and going forward, if the usage pattern of a tenant namespace just changed, is grow from a light user to a pro user. So it's not that trivial as it seems. Actually, that ties back to our previous solutions. So for ob with observability and troubleshooting, it doesn't just solve the uh, problem at the moment but it also helps us going forward. It helps us better understand our tenant's profile and we can make informed decisions and to how to place them and whether we need a rebalancing like a year from now. And then secondly, imagine we already made our federation choice and we have a perfect API to guard ourselves to make such re-architecting or rebalancing without sacrificing their user experience. Say, I, user don't want to be interrupted for anything that is not obvious. Okay, um, so with these helpers, we can finally achieve the tenant workload isolation in a convenient and comfortable way. I mean, comfortable is more for our confidence so uh, as you might notice earlier, we specifically skipped the topic of how can we achieve multi cluster federation. It's a very broad and difficult topic. Uh, hope you all understand that and forgive us. Uh, but we do have another talk tomorrow. Uh, it's around noon, I think. So on platform engineering track, we'll talk a bit more about how we get started with the multi-cluster federation and um, I hope it will be a helpful uh, sharing experience for everyone. So yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Um, now we can have some uh, communication session now. Thanks. So again, there's a mic back there, mic over there. There we go. Hello. Oops, sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to play a devil's advocate here a little bit. And you mentioned that you can't scale a control plane, like API, API server. But why not? Because you can add more memory to it, you can add more like in-flight requests to it. So it really depends on 
what scale you are, but it didn't seem like 10,000 workflows per week is enough to justify like many clusters. But obviously I, I don't know like enough about your workloads. So I'm just like curious to hear like if you explored this topic more. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, we actually consider that um, we can probably add more instance or uh, more uh, resource allocation to the API server. But the thing is, um, we have so many tenants, uh, namespaces already, and the workflow scale just keep growing. It triggers those uh, timeouts at one time, and it's not happening all the time, but we do need to think about um, how this solution would behave going forward. So we can definitely add more resource for now, but it doesn't seem like a sustainable growth in the future. So we're, while we're unsure about how fast we can grow, and so we figured can, combined with the different SLA requirements, it's a really good chance to just isolate the tenants into uh, different clusters. Okay. So hope that answers your question. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a question. So um, you say that um, you can um, share your clusters and then you have a namespace for each tenant, right? Um, my question is uh, if one of your tenants grows too big, then you need to shard it through multiple clusters, right? Um, maybe you never face this issue, but I would be very interested to know how then you schedule this, or how do you manage? Uh, sorry, uh, could you increase the volume a little bit? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Here yeah, is better? Uh, it's better now. Okay. Uh, ooh, uh, yeah. So yeah, so, so you can so have, um, you, you shard your clusters, and then you have um, tenants um, in different namespaces. Do you uh, face the issue where you have uh, one tenant that then grow very uh, big and then you need to shard it um, through multiple clusters? Huh? Uh, so the question's clear. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll let my TL to take over that question. So, Thanks. you're right, we were talking about um, sharding of namespaces. Luckily, we are not at the point where we need more than a cluster for a single tenant. So what uh, this talk was mostly about is how can we ensure the service level for everyone who is participating on this shared platform and how can we make sure that individual tenants don't overload a particular namespace or a particular controller by sharding them across multiple clusters. What you're saying is absolutely right, but we're not at that scale yet. You're great. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the observability. Uh, we are struggling with uh, uh, monitoring and uh, using the observability with the workflows. For example, a uh, job is stuck or it failed. Uh, the UI is pretty limited. You can sort the developers are complaining about it. And in Prometheus, what we have is the monitoring without the specific job. Like we can see how many uh, jobs fail, but we don't see the specific job. So how do you do this observability with so many uh, workflows running? Uh, do you have some dashboards to, to, to expose or to share with us? Uh, it's really interesting. Okay, so um, yeah, that's, uh, um, that's really case by case, depends on what aspect you're interested in. So for example, if I just want to know the creation rate uh, or the real-time counts uh, of the workflow or pod per cluster, then metrics is just good enough uh, without a crazy uh, cardinality of time, time series. Uh, however, if you want to look at it in, in a more troubleshooting aspect, um, in such case, you need more in-depth detail of individual workflow or pod. Uh, in general, we think maybe log lines or even trace would help you better. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the metrics won't help as much like that. Um, yeah, so the controller is designed in a general way that it can uh, 
allow you to customize metrics and the logs altogether. So you're using tracing to, to actually see where it fails? And... Yeah, it can be captured by, um, uh, by events coming in, or it can be also identified at the reconciliation phase. Uh, depends on which kind of um, state that you want to track. Okay, thank you. All right, awesome, thank you.